in the years around 1580, in the city of Florence, Italy, in the home of Giovanni de Bardi, Count of Vernio, a group of people came together to solve a common problem. They called themselves the Florentine Camerata. Camerata is literally a small orchestra or choir, but in this case, it was a group of musicians and scientists and philosophers and astrologers and, and noblemen and clergymen who all came together because they wanted to change their world. They wanted to reform modern music. What Vincenzo Galilei, member of the Camerata and father of Galileo, called corrupt and incomprehensible contemporary music, according to Wikipedia at one point in time. That music was polyphony, and it sounds like this. Now, polyphony has four or five melodies, all equally important, all intertwined, and it's maximized for a feeling of holiness. But the camarada dared to ask the revolutionary question, what if we could understand the words? <laughs> In particular, they wanted to find the optimum balance of words and music to convey emotion and many emotions, not only holiness. The camarada reminds me of an agile team. And this is why I'm so fascinated by this group. So see how many parallels you can find. First of all, it wasn't just musicians, it's also thinkers of many kinds, artists and poets and mathematicians and philosophers. Uh, they had sponsorship. So they met in the home of Giovanni de Bardi and also Jacobo Corsi and other noblemen and, and various other uh, places in Florence. They had a common mission, their shared purpose to reform polyphony, and they had some agreed upon methods. So back then, they thought that history moved in a circle rather than a progression or a spiral. And so moving backwards was also moving forwards. So the Camerata did a lot of research on the ancient Greek practice of setting words to music. And there's some disagreement among musicologists. It's not like they had recordings. So maybe they were serious about this and maybe they just wanted to lend legitimacy to their work. So it's kind of like when I quote computer science papers from the 1970s. The Camerata got together every couple weeks and they talked and exchanged ideas. Caccini, who's one of, the, one of the members said, I learned more from their learned discussions than from 30 years of descant. Now descant, I had to look that one up. That means lecturing, so what you're getting now. Fortunately, you have the rest of the conference for learned discussions. They didn't just talk. They also practiced playing music together and experimented. Uh, they did code review. Now, I find it interesting that the censors who were appointed to criticize the, uh, the performance were appointed for the occasion. It wasn't just that asshole who hates you and takes it out on your code. <laughs> they didn't all get along. So there was some rivalry. Barty and Corsi, the, the two chief sponsors, Barty wanted to do more talking and Corsi wanted to do more playing of music. It takes, it takes both. And similarly, the musical stars, Caccini was like, it's about the music with some words. And Perry was like, it's about the words with some music. But it worked out, it worked out. In the end, the Florentine Camerata did make history. They changed music as we know it. They invented the stile representativo, the radical idea of one melody with a little bit of musical accompaniment. Everything that now seems obvious wasn't always. So this, that sounds like this. Here's Monteverdi with one of the first operas we still have the score for. Now, I still can't understand the words. 
but I don't speak Italian. And I'm told, if you do speak Italian, that doesn't help either, <laughs> because this is ancient Italian. But back in the day, back in the day, people did get it, and they were excited, and music became relevant and important to whole categories of people. Monteverde, he wasn't a member of the Camerata, but he was corresponding with people who were, he knew them, he learned about this, and pretty soon all of Italy was, was interested in opera, and then it spread throughout the world and ushered in the Baroque era. Totally changed the world. But that's not what interests me about this group. What interests me, what caught my attention and made me want to study them, was what the individuals did afterward. So here are some, just some, of the publications of members of the Camerata after 1600. And yes, there are operas here, but there is also philosophy, mathematics, scientific treatises. And these are fewer than half of the members of the Camerata who have Wikipedia articles today. They did not expect that in 16th century Florence. What is it about that group of people coming together and then each going on to do something interesting. So I went back to research the Camerata and I found this paper, Collective Problem Solving in the History of Music by Dr. Ruth Katz, musicologist. I found it, well, I found it on the internet, but it was published in the Journal of the History of Ideas. And Dr. Katz points out that the, the Camerata is a lot like what in science they call an invisible college. So an invisible college is a group of peers who exchange ideas about a shared interest and make progress on a common puzzle. And it's recognized that this is where the advances in science come from. I mean, yeah, we love to give the Nobel Prize to a person or a couple people, but who worked in their lab who shared a faculty lounge with them down the hall? Who did they correspond with? Who criticized earlier versions of those ideas? Who did all the observations, the detailed observations that made this generalized theory possible? Who did a bunch of failed experiments that led to the useful ones? For instance, Ben Franklin, as a kid, we learned that Ben Franklin discovered electricity. But Franklin was working along with dozens of amateur electricians throughout the world. And they corresponded and they talked to each other and they shared their theories and they criticized each other's theories and they shared the results of their experiments. So the successful experiments that he did, for every one of those, there were hundreds he didn't have to do because someone else did. An idea, when the world is ready for an idea, it doesn't come to just one person and one person alone can't make it real. So Dr. Katz describes, oh, all, the, all the quotes in this paper, by the way, come from that one, all the quotes in this presentation come from that one paper, unless otherwise attributed. Dr. Katz describes invisible colleges, some characteristics. They have um, agreed upon methods, so understandings of what kind of research is appropriate. They have priority problems. That means fighting over who is first, more on that later. And they have that shared language, that shared language that you develop with your team which is both essential for teamwork and a natural outcome of teamwork, that kind of cycles. One of my favorite camaradas from science is the Club of Honest Wigs, which met fortnightly in the London Coffee House to dine and imbibe and discuss science, especially electricity, religion, politics, and other matters. This is around 1770. And it, it, this uh, story comes from the book, The Invention of Air, which is about Joseph Priestley. Now, Priestley is credited with the discovery of oxygen. He didn't do much with that, but he did pass it off to Lavoisier, who created chemistry. Um, I, but Priestley did some other really interesting things. Uh, for instance, he discovered the carbonated beverage. He passed that off to somebody who made a lot of money. And, and... He was the first to notice, we did a lot of experiments. We'd like take a small animal, put it in a jar, and see how long it takes to die. And he also did this with plants. Put the, you know, weigh the plant, how big is it? Put it in a jar, how long does it take to die? Now how much does it weigh? That kind of thing. One day, he put the, the mouse and the plant in the same jar, and they didn't die nearly as soon. 
the importance of this observation wasn't recognized until like the 1920s when ecology became a thing. But he noticed that carbon dioxide oxygen life cycle thing much earlier. So that's interesting. And Priestley was tremendously helped by this group, the, the Club of Honest Whigs, which included Ben Franklin. Um, a, an important thing about the coffee house part. So this was during the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was a period of, of great advancement. And one of the reasons for that was, was the coffee bit, because at this period, people started importing coffee all over Europe. And so they're drinking coffee with breakfast now instead of beer. <laughs> and everyone got a little smarter. <laughs> Every discipline was new again, and whole new disciplines emerged. <laughs> right? So this, this kind of thing, and it happens in music, it happens in science, it also happens in art. Dr. Katz points out, of course, the salons in Paris, where you have artists, but also critics and dealers, all the stakeholders in the art world, everyone who's interested in thinking about these things, they come together informally and regularly uh, to discuss the common puzzles of the day. Now in art, a puzzle represents a new artistic style. For instance, the Impressionists solved, how do I paint not what is, but what I see? So Monet and Cezanne, they were strong influences, having solved that puzzle on people like Van Gogh, um, all of whom met in a coffee house like this one. I got to take this, this picture because I went to Paris to give this talk. And so I went up the hill to Montmartre and I took this, it's a sad picture, but, but it's great because this is one of the salons that they met in and its name is the Agile Bunny, <laughs> except in French. And that's just down the street from this house. And here's a plaque with a bunch of names on it of famous painters and printmakers and stuff like that who all lived in this one house around the same time. And then they all went on to be famous. It's not a coincidence. They learned something from each other. Van Gogh, for instance, now this is one of the paintings that he painted in the Netherlands before he came to Paris. And I think that's a cabbage and that might be a carrot, but there's not a lot of orange. His brother Theo was down in Paris and was an art dealer and he was like, Vincent, you must come. You have no idea what colors these people are using here. So yeah, Vincent, eventually he got evicted in the Netherlands and so he went down to Paris. And sure enough, he learned so much. And Theo remarked, you have built for us a circle of artists and friends. And all of these other painters, they, they worked together, they painted each other's portraits, and they interacted. Uh, Gauguin is the one that Van Gogh cut his ear off over. And later, Gauguin's paintings show up in the salon, the atelier, of Gertrude Stein. Gertrude and her brother, Leo, they were Americans, but, but they were living in Paris, and they had some money, so they fed a lot of artists and other people. Um, Gertrude Stein's uh, Saturday night dinners in her atelier uh, included, well, some painters. Whitehead is a mathematician, Apollinaire is a poet and writers, and the interesting people who were thinking about paint art and also politics in the day. And she had like the first collection of modern art because she was collecting it as it became a thing. Later, Picasso goes on to start his own salon because he's one of the very few artists who made money in his lifetime. And he and George Brock invented cubism Cubism solves the problem of how do I paint not one perspective, but all the perspectives at the same time. And here are some philosophers and photographers and all different kinds of people. One of the painters who came through his salon is Alexandra Exter, and she was from Kiev. And she went back to Kiev and she took the ideas that she learned from interacting with Picasso and his friends, and she taught them to these other Alexes that she went to high school with in her own salon. And Bogomazov, he painted this goat head, which is on my bedroom wall today. Ideas, they grow as we share them. They're not conserved. We don't need to keep them to ourselves. The more we spread them, the bigger they get, and the more impact we can have. I've also noticed this in software, this part where we have a great team, and the great ideas come out of that, and so do great people. I gave this talk in December 
in Australia, and Kent Beck was in the audience. And he came up to me afterward and he was like, oh, have you heard of the Hillside Group? Because that was one of my earliest camaradas. And this is a group of people who, they wanted to solve the problem of how do we write software that we can like keep in our heads and that people can understand later? How do we make this legible? And they had Christopher Alexander's architecture patterns. And they're like, how do we find the patterns in software? They met several times over a couple years. This is just a few of them. Ralph Johnson wrote the, he's one of the gang of four who wrote the design patterns book. And later, uh, oh, Grady Booch, that's uh, object-oriented programming, I think. Um, later, a lot of these people were also in other camaradas around extreme programming, for instance, along with other people. Let's see, Ward Cunningham invented the wiki. Uh, Martin Fowler is known for refactoring. Michael Feathers created legacy code. <laughs> Another one that, that I've noticed just going to conferences uh, is ThoughtWorks London around 2003 to 2006. So here you have a bunch of people, they're not all at the same client, but they are working for the same consultancy, so they have regular interactions with each other. They needed to solve the problem of how do we deliver software in less than two weeks without breaking everything. And out of this, you get continuous integration, continuous delivery. Jez and Dave wrote the book on that. Jez went on to write a bunch more books about continuous delivery and with other people. Um, meanwhile, Dan North was a leader of that group, and now he's known for behavior-driven design, among other things. Nat Price has stuff on unit testing. Sam Newman is the prophet of microservices. Another example around the same time, the group that created the Spring Framework in Java and then created the company Spring Source. Uh, they were all scattered around the world, but they came together to solve the problem of how do we write J2EE without stabbing our eyes out. <laughs> and now Rod is my CEO. Christian also works at Atomist. Um, but we've got Elasticsearch, TaskTop, Venture Capital. Um, last year at QCon London, I was like, who's this Rob Harrop guy who's keynoting? And Rod and Christian were like, oh, we know him. They keep springing up, and in, in different, they're doing different things now, most of them, but they're all interesting. I think the evidence is in. Great teams make great people. You want it to be the other way around. You want to take a bunch of great developers and put them together and poof, get a great team. I've never seen that work. But I have seen the other, the other way around. Great teams make great people. Why? Why is this? Because if we know why, then maybe we can do it on purpose. Okay, I have a model that helps explain this and also some of the other mysteries in software development. It's a little different, but I want to share it with you because I think it may be useful to you as well. It starts with Gregory Bateson. Gregory Bateson was an anthropologist. These are some of his camaradas. He worked along with uh, his wife, Margaret Mead. She was an anthropologist. And we've got um, Norbert Wiener and John von Neumann. And a bunch of other really brilliant people came together to create the field of cybernetics, which now we call systems thinking. This idea that it isn't just, you can't break a system down into its parts, understand each part, and think that lets you understand the system. The relationships matter, the context matters. That's huge. One of Gregory Bateson's other contributions is his daughter, Nora. So Nora grew up, she's also an anthropologist, and she grew up in this atmosphere of systems thinking, of contextualized, careful study of systems where they are. And she said, we need a new word. Because system doesn't cut it. When you think of a system, you can think of a machine where the parts hold still. And yes, they have complicated interactions, but we could hypothetically uh, model that. In the, in the 50s and 60s, like uh, the ecologists, they had hundreds of grad students spending thousands of hours cordoning off squares of prairie, square meters of prairie, and counting the blades of grass and measuring how much of each bug was in each square because they thought if they just got enough numbers into the computer and enough formulas that they could predict the outcomes of the ecosystem. And it never worked. Of course it never worked. 
because those bugs aren't the same from generation to generation. That grass isn't the same. All the species involved here are evolving in response to each other, in response to their environment, and they're changing their environment and each other at the same time. This is more than a system. Nora coined the word symathesy from the Latin, sim together, and mathesy learning. This is a, a learning system based on learning parts with flows of mutual learning going through it. And a symathesy is a very powerful idea. So systems thinking, we know from Acoff that a system is more than the sum of its parts. That would be an aggregate. It's also the product of its relationship. But a symathesy takes this farther because the parts are a product of all the past interactions. This is incredibly powerful. There are no zero-sum games in a symathesy. We grow together or we lose together. Of course, our teams are symathesies. As humans, we're definitely the product of all our past interactions. So our team is more than a sum of its parts. Here we have some people, and that leafy thing represents the environment, our desks and chairs and whatnot. And the relationships matter, and we've started to recognize that in our field. Thank you, Agile. Um, but I think in the case of a software team, it's more than that. Every team is a somathesy, but we have even more. Okay, okay. So define team. My team is everyone required for me to be successful. And success for me as a developer is impacting the lives of humans by operating useful software. Okay, for that to happen, I need some people, yes. Some of them are even near me in the org chart. I also need that software to be running in production, not just code. I need running software that's interacting with users. That software is on my team. And it's part of my somathesy because it's learning from me, because I change it, that's my job. And I'm learning from it. Every time it throws an exception, makes a log message, changes some data, I have the opportunity to learn what's really going on between that software and its users. But not directly, of course. I need my log aggregators. I need my SQL queries. And to change the software, I need my editor, and I need my source control, and I need my build pipeline, and I need my automated tests. And I'm, I'm learning from my tools. That's the only way I can learn from my software. And oh, that test broke. That's informational. But they're learning from me, too, because oh, now I'm going to teach that test. This is actually correct now. And hopefully, I can improve my continuous integration. And I can at least write queries in my log aggregator, but hopefully I can improve those tools too, because I am a developer and I have that power. We have the power to teach our tools. And so they're part of the somathesy. This is a socio-technical system. And I mean, this is a very simplified version, right? It's actually really complicated. So this tells me a couple things. One, it answers the question why I need to bring my whole self to work or as much of it as I choose to. Because to be part of a living system, I need to be alive within it. And two, it answers this question that's been bugging me for years of why is this so hard? Because <sighs> I've been a developer for 20 years and you'd think I'd get better at it and it'd get easier, but I get better at it and it just gets harder. It wasn't always like this. When I started programming, it was just me, and my piece of the program that I was assigned to, and people told me what it should do in the future. And if I needed some data, I said, how do we use the database? And they gave me a book on Oracle. Just kidding, I had to buy it myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> but these days, I say, oh, I need some data. Hmm, which database shall we use, or databases? And how shall we do migrations? And where shall we do backups, and where shall we run it? And do we need caching? And my perspective is broader. Um, and so I have more powers, but also the, the better I get at this, the wider I think, and the harder this job gets. If you take it further, you get to the level of senior individual contributor, architect, principal engineer, whatever you want to call it. Those people in the team who are thinking about more than just the software their team is responsible for, but the whole system especially the technical system, but also the social system that's involved. These people are extremely valuable.
they have both bonding social capital within the team and bridging social capital outside of the team and outside of the company. This is important for a couple reasons. One, you, your team needs to have influence on the system around it. That bug in the prairie changes its square meter. And as a whole, the prairie changes the whole environment. It grows it, it, or it gets taken over by trees. You can't have a self-organizing system that doesn't change its environment. You can't put a team in a box and say, over there, self-organize, leave me alone. It's semantheses all the way up. The other reason that you need that bridging social capital is because you can't possibly have all the knowledge you need on the team all the time. At some point, you need experts. Experts in why does this work like this in this company? And what impact is this going to have? You need experts in technologies that your company hasn't used yet. And so you need the people that you meet at this conference so that you can call them and be like, I know you use Kubernetes. Tell me more about it. We need that. Now, these, these senior engineers or whatever, you want to call them, are remarkably important because they have this broad perspective and they understand the system as a whole. You can't hire that. That doesn't happen. It takes a lot of time to understand what's going on within a company and within a system. Now, you can hire people who can get there faster, who have been there before, and maybe in six months or a, or a year, will have gained enough of this understanding. But that is in opposition to hiring someone who can hit the ground running. Because if you want me to jump in and make code changes, I need to narrow in on the piece that I'm working on, or even better, a new piece, and just care about that little piece. And then I can go and I can make changes quickly. I can do that. or. I can dig into, where does this get deployed? Why is that? What does this affect? How do our test environments work? Who uses this? And then I'm starting to gain that, that broader perspective. Now, I've seen people who can do either. Richard Feldman is in here somewhere. But not at the same time. So decide what you want and hire for that, or even better, promote. There's one more thing that I need to put in this picture before we move on, because it's missing something. There's a really important distinction here. We're all trying to learn from each other, the human and technical sides of the system. Uh, and with humans, we can, we can talk. I can see what you're doing, and I can tap you on the shoulder, maybe, or at least ping you in Slack. But these people can't just look down and see what's going on in their software until Tron is a thing. They can't just kick it when they want it to go again. It's not like objects on a table. We have to work with this software through the line of representation. That is the barrier between the social and technical, the human and digital parts of the system. And it represents our screens, what we can see on the screen, and what we can type on the keyboard or click with the mouse, the buttons that we give ourselves. Those are on the line of representation. Our log aggregators, our IDE is on the line of representation. These are really crucial because the holes in that line of representation represents all the learning we can do. So you start to realize how important our tools are because that's what we have. At the crudest level, you have SSH. I don't want SSH access to production, please. I want more carefully designed tools that give me the right access and not the wrong access. This line is really important. And one reason is because um, it's the only way we can establish and test our mental models. So since we can't work with the software directly, we can't touch it and move it around, we have to make decisions of what to do based on our mental model of how the software is working. And Woods' law says that for any sufficiently complex system, and we're way past that in our software, everyone's mental model is necessarily incomplete and out of date. And everyone's mental model is incomplete and out of date in different ways. Now, that's actually good. That's good because I don't want a bunch of people with the same mental model I have. My mental model isn't big enough. I need people with different skills. We need that shared language. We need overlapping mental models so that we can communicate and coordinate but, and cooperate. But we don't need to be the same. 
Um, Cesar Hidalgo is a statistical physicist, and in his book, How Information Grows, he talks about the concept of a person byte. A person byte is the maximum amount of information that you can cram into one human's head, that one human, human can cram into their own head, over a lifetime. It doesn't matter how big that is. It doesn't matter whether yours is bigger than the person next to you. What matters is that it's finite. It's finite and it's way smaller than the reality of the systems that we're dealing with here. So we have to be experts in different parts. We have to go back and verify the parts of our mental model that are relative, relevant to this particular change. It doesn't just matter what reality is. It matters what we see. And these mental models are incredibly valuable because they let us make good decisions. And they're incredibly hard to acquire. And however hard you think it is to acquire a mental model of a system you haven't, you haven't uh, written, it's harder. I started to understand this when I read the book Vehicles by Valentino Breitenberg. He's a philosopher. This is like 1970 or something. And he talks about the law of downhill invention, uphill analysis. This says that when you start from a simple system that you made, and then you build it up, and you build it up, and you add complexity, and you add interesting bits, and you add features, and you're building your mental model in your head at the same time, that is way easier. That is so much easier than coming to an existing complex system that already works and figuring out how it works and building that mental model from scratch. This explains why there are a thousand JavaScript frameworks. Because it is literally easier, mentally easier, to be like, well, I just needed to do this one thing. I don't need that whole complicated library that does all this other stuff, and it's way over complicated. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> right now, you just need to do this one thing, and then you're going to need a little more, and you're going to a little more, and it will work for you to build that mental model up. It will not work for anyone else. They will join the team and you'll be like, well, this is obvious. And they'll be like, where's the documentation? You'll be like, it's over there. It's out of date and it doesn't matter. And that's not going to do it anyway. Um, it is easier to do that than to learn React in spite of hundreds of people spending thousands of hours on documentation, on getting the design right, on answering questions on Stack Overflow, on making this as approachable as we can. There are still all these concepts in React that you don't need right now, but you're going to. And that's the thing. It's so much easier to make a system learnable than to make it work. And when you, when you think about this, then you can start to understand this situation. OK. Here, Purple Developer has a really good mental model of this system. They probably wrote it. And Purple Developer's been maintaining this system for a while, and that's fine. But maybe Purple Developer wants to move on. Or maybe they want more changes than Purple Developer wants to handle by themselves. And so here come blue and green. They've been assigned to this project, probably part-time. And they do not have a mental model of the system. So they start poking around and trying to figure it out. Meanwhile, it is so possible, and I've seen this happen multiple times, Purple is chugging along fixing tickets. And he is ch they are changing this system so fast that no matter how smart blue and green are, they'll never get a grasp of it. They'll never have an accurate mental model because purple is so efficient that they can change it right out from under blue and green. And meanwhile, purple is chugging through tickets and is like, what's wrong with these morons? Everything takes them a week and then they get it wrong. OK, they don't know what they know. That's so hard here. Purple doesn't know. He, to, to purple, this really is obvious. But it's not to anyone else. And meanwhile, one of these people looks like a 10x developer. And if the incentives here for purple are to get tickets done and look productive, then why would they change anything? The solution to this problem, the only way that I've seen to really move that mental model from purple's head into blue and greens is for purple to take their hands off the keyboard. Purple may not change this system except through the fingers of blue and or green. So pair programming or even better mob programming. This changing it together, 
that transfers this kind of knowledge. Because then Blue gets the opportunity to ask the question, how did you know to change that there? Isn't that going to affect this other thing? Oh, no, that's not even used anymore. Crap, I would have spent a week on that. Oh, I've been there. So when a purple does that, then yeah, it slows down initially. But, but over, but rather quick, more quickly than you think, blue and green really get a grasp and the system becomes theirs as well. And this is an illustration of those priority problems that show up in an invisible college. Because if only one person is going to get that Nobel Prize, then there's a major conflict between do you keep the idea to yourself so you can be first to publish it, or do you share it so it can grow? so other people can criticize it and help you improve it. I don't want that kind of conflict in my team. Because ideas, they're not conserved. They don't get smaller when you share them, they get bigger. And I want my team to grow. And how, okay, so I want my team to grow. How do I grow a team? Well, if my team were an aggregate, I would grow it by adding more people. But man, keeping that shared language and those over mental mo overlapping mental models is really high overhead. That really seriously limits the size of our teams. Our relationships matter. And yes, when we improve communications with the people, that totally helps. But in a, in a system, you measure magnitude. You can't really measure the relationships, right? That's hard to measure. But what you can measure sometimes is the flows. So in the economy, there's a system for you. We don't measure its geography to say whether it's getting bigger. We don't even measure the amount of money in it to say whether it's getting bigger. We measure the flows of money. So if I buy a $5 coffee and the coffee shop pays its worker and the worker pays the plumber and the plumber pays, pays their rent, that's $20 to, added to GDP. We measure the flows. In ecology, when we're, when we're trying to decide whether the prairie is growing, is it healthy, is it getting prairie -er. um, we, we measure the flows of carbon between species, or nitrogen or phosphorus, whatever the limiting nutrient is. So how much carbon is moving from the grass to a bug to the next bigger bug? If you add species or increase the flows between species, the, the, um, the ecosystem is growing. In a semathesy, what we care about is those flows of mutual learning. So if you want to grow your team, grow the learning that's happening in your team, especially the learning between the software and the humans, which means you have to, you have to really care about your tools because they're, they are your puncture points in that line of representation. This is hard to measure, but it's not that hard to detect if you think about it. You can notice when learning is happening. Look for that. Because purple here, if purple wants to grow, it's not going to help him to solve more tickets, more of the same tickets on the same system. If purple wants to grow, they need to grow the team. And that means sharing with blue and green. Because it's ironic. There's two kinds of 10x developers. There's the, the one that looks like a 10x developer because relative to the other people on the team that don't share that mental model and they're hoarding it, and then there's the real 10x developers that are growing the whole team. Because that's a thing. If Purple wants to be great, he needs, they need to care about the team. Uh, if they share with blue and green, one, they'll learn, oh, I guess that part wasn't as obvious as I thought it was. And they'll learn from their perspective. But more than that, now Purple can go on and do other things. It's one of those ironic things. If you want to be a great developer, put the team first. There's a book by John Kay uh, called Obliquity. It's a short book and it's really wonderful. I highly recommend it. It talks about how you can't get happy by aiming for happiness and you can't make profit by aiming only for profit. That's not sustainable. And it's the same here. If you want to become great, put the team first. Also, if you think that you can't, you just can't hire enough great developers, there's just not enough out there, we better relocate our headquarters to San Francisco. That's not the thing, because great developers aren't born, not even in San Francisco. And they're not trained. You can only get so much from YouTube and documentation. 
great developers are synthesized. All right, so this is the point that I wanted to get to. Thanks. Um, when I researched the Camerata. But as I was reading that paper, I came upon a fact that shocked me. Just like made me say, what? And it led me to a conclusion that's even more interesting and is kind of audacious. And I want to share it with you. It starts with the surrounding culture that made the Camerata possible at all. Thank you. They were in Florence, the center of the Renaissance, at the height of the Renaissance. There was innovation in the air. Now, interesting aside about the word innovation, back in Priestley's day, innovation was a bad word. It was a negative word. It indicated an idea that was threatening to the existing order and therefore harmful. But Priestley, he moved to America later and had a lot of um, um, correspondence with Jefferson and Adams and the people who are making this country uh, what it is as, as it gets started. And um, Jefferson and Franklin and John Adams, and they, they had this radical idea that maybe if we applied rational thought and thought clearly about the world, maybe we could come up with ideas that would be innovative and not harmful but actually useful and move the world forward. So that was new then. But here, Katz is using innovation in its, in its present sense of a positive. Because the Camerata didn't come up with opera out of nowhere. They were part of a century that was pregnant with social, cultural, and ideological ideas from which opera emerged. One of those crucial ideas was the practice of systematic testing and measurement. So Vincenzo Galilei was the first known person to uh, identify and document the ratios between notes and things. So like he, he strung out a string and put a weight on it and, until it made a C. Bing, 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 pretend that's a C. And then, and then he like shortened the string until bing, 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 he got the next octave up. And you notice the ratios there. And then he added weight to the string until bing, 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 he gets another C. And then there's a ratio there, too, between the weights, and then between the notes and between the chords and stuff like that. For a mathematical basis to music, I'm sure that was useful to the camarada somehow. In Priestley's day, in the Enlightenment, uh, they had empiricism. They had the idea that you could take a theory about the world and reason out some consequences. If this is true, what would also be true that I can test? And then they can test their theories. These days, we have new ways of thinking as well. We have systems thinking. Now, not every theory has to be universal. The interesting ones are contextual. We can see that more than one perspective matters. We need to see from many perspectives at the same time. And we have new ways of thinking with software, too, because we have programs now. We don't just think with our brains. We can also think with our computers. We can do math that we couldn't before. We can simulate things. We're smarter. Every discipline is new again, and whole new disciplines are emerging. The Camerata had the printing press for dissemination of knowledge about the ancient Greek practice of wedding words to music. We have the internet for maximum dissemination of all the knowledge everywhere. But availability is knowledge, of knowledge is not enough because a single person can only have so much. So we need to mix the people with different overlapping units of knowledge, areas of knowledge. We need the other thing that was essential to the formation of the Camerata. And that was the existence of these groups with diverse interests and skills was new to this time period in the Renaissance. And that comes down to the bit that, that just shocked me and blew me away, which was that during the Renaissance was when art, with a capital A, became a thing. And I was like, what? There was a time when art wasn't a thing? Thing. 
I'm like, I go to the museum and we go back to 3000 BC in the art museum. And yeah, they're not very interesting. And some of them are super creepy, but, but they were doing art back then. Yeah, they were, but they didn't call it that. They didn't give it the importance and kind of the honor that we give art and culture today. Because back in the Middle Ages, they had painters, sculptors, poets, musicians, but these were crafts. And they had guilds alongside the goldsmiths and the bricklayers and the people who put shoes on horses and, and the blacksmiths. And, um, and if you wanted to be a painter, you joined the painting guild and you got into the painting guild because your dad was in the painting guild, not from any particular talent. And after work, you hung out with painters and goldsmiths because that was the related guild that you kind of shared a, a clubhouse with. And, and out of that, you got some things. You got competence, okay? Any painter that you hired who was a member of the painting guild could hold a brush, could make a reasonable facsimile of what you asked them to paint, the scene you asked them for. But at some point, the guild system started to break down, and you've got these renegade artists who, only, who want to specialize, and maybe they want to paint the kind of thing they're really good and fascinated by painting. And then you've got the merchant class who can hire the people who are excellent artists. So you start to get a recognition of excellence. And then uh, people started to realize that there was like some indefinable essence that weaves through composition and poetry and sculpting and painting. And they didn't have a name for it. And they didn't know how to teach it. I think today we would call that creativity. But they just, once they recognized that there was something ineffable and, and like worth thinking about in all of these arts, then you get these cultured circles like the Camerata and you get academies and you wanna be a painter, you can go to the academy and yes, you learn how to hold a brush, but you also learn about history and philosophy and you interact with people who aren't just painters. You get this transformation of people who can paint circles into heterogeneous circles with lots of different skills. The Renaissance was a period of decompartmentalization, a breaking down of the existing traditions that kept things in order, but also apart. Developers, testers, operations. This can get you a reasonable facsimile of what you asked for, but it will not get you what you need. And also, you have, you have the new style of art that emphasizes the effect it has on people instead of whether the brush was held correctly. It's not about code coverage. It's not about how many design patterns did you use. It's not about code style. It is about the impact your software has on the world. Software is not a craft. And I am not a crafts person. Okay, programming is an important skill. It is a completely necessary skill. Painter has to understand canvases and programming is useful. But Java is like acrylic paint and Ruby is watercolor and Bash is a song on a lute. May it not be played in an orchestra. <laughs> These are necessary skills, but they're not the essence of what we do. I'm also not saying that software is art. Art has an impact. I mean, if I listen to a symphony or I look at a painting, it might change how I think. And that can change my behavior, and that can change the physical world. Software is way more direct than that. Dude, if I pick up that little box down there, and I tap on it in just the right way, a car shows up and takes me where I want to go. That did not happen five years ago, and I think it is awesome. Now, that took more than software. It also took people, but software is an essential component in that. Software as a medium is unlike anything humans have had the opportunity to work with before. It is more moldable than plastic. It is more flexible than hot metal. You can almost design right into it. And the feedback. We don't have to wait 15 years for the bridge to fall down. 20 years to find out if people hate this house. 
we can see our unit test pass in seconds. And if this is a web app, we can deploy it and have feedback on how it changed user behavior in a matter of a few weeks. That is completely different and it changes how we can work. I'm not saying that software is an art, but art wasn't always recognized as a distinct thing. I am saying that software is something new. Software is the next thing after art that we don't have a name for yet. The closest I can come in words is that ongoing software development is the practice of semathesy. And that makes me a semathicist <laughs> in the medium of software. Now, I really like this slide, except for one thing. It has my name on it. And ideas do not belong to one person. Because it takes a camarada, and then a community, and then a culture to make it real in the world. So we are all semathicists if we choose to think of ourselves that way. And I am incredibly excited to be alive right now and in software, because software is the next thing after art. And this, this is the next age after the Renaissance. We have new ways to think about the world and new ways to change the world that we live in. If you manage to get this right, you'll surrender by early night. The world will never be the same. That's my daughter Evelyn singing Hamilton, the modern opera. May our work have such an impact 400 years from now. Thank you. <laughs>